Uh, well, thank you all for coming. I'm joined today uh, by Dr. Kerry Chant, our Chief Health Officer, uh, and Susan Pearce, Deputy Secretary of New South Wales Health. Uh, can I begin by today acknowledging the, the, the fact that uh, 29 people across our state um, have died uh, with COVID um, over the last uh, 24 hours. And on behalf of the government and the people of New South Wales, uh, can I extend uh, my thoughts, my prayers, uh, and our hearts go out to um, all families uh, right across New South Wales um, uh, who have lost a loved one at this time. Uh, can I also uh, acknowledge today the great work, the fantastic work of, every, of all our frontline health workers right across New South Wales uh, for the efforts that they are making day in, day out. Uh, I met many nurses uh, with Minister Ayres out at Nepean Hospital uh, on Sunday uh, just last week, uh, and they are truly an inspiration to everybody across the state uh, for the continued work they do in keeping our people safe. It has been a difficult two years. Uh, we've come through that together, uh, and our heroes on the front line, our nurses, our doctors, our paramedics, our triple zero call operators are doing an amazing job uh, in a difficult and challenging time um, in ensuring uh, that we keep people safe as we move through uh, not just uh, this period of time, but over uh, the next 12 months as well. So once again, can I thank uh, all our frontline health workers uh, right across New South Wales uh, for the work that they are doing day in, day out uh, in keeping people safe um, at this time. I'd also uh, like to uh, acknowledge the uh, decisions that we made yesterday uh, in the National Cabinet. Uh, we agreed uh, to uh, six principles um, in relation to schools. Um, as we have said here in New South Wales, we are completely committed uh, to getting schools open day one, term one, in a way that is safe uh, for students uh, and for teachers. Um, and we are, as we agreed yesterday, uh, we will be finalising those plans with the uh, Department of Education and New South Wales Health. Uh, we are working very closely with the Victorian Government where we are obviously in a very similar situation in relation to the virus uh, to have those plans uh, submitted at National Cabinet uh, next week. Um, and by submitting those plans, uh, we will release those publicly uh, following National Cabinet uh, on Thursday. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we made some changes. Uh, mainly, uh, we had already uh, worked through this um, approach uh, here in New South Wales uh, in respect of critical workers who are deemed to be uh, close contacts. Um, and some of those changes that we've made uh, for those close contact exemptions include health, emergency services, safety, law enforcement, justice and correctional services, uh, energy resources, water, uh, waste management, uh, food, beverage and other critical goods uh, and you'll all be happy to know uh, the media as well. Uh, so um, those changes um, have, been, have been made. If you'd like further information, uh, they are available on the health website. I'd also like to reiterate the point the Prime Minister made uh, yesterday um, in relation to the definition of close contacts. And just to confirm that a close contact definition is legally someone who is a household contact of a COVID positive case. Uh, Dr Kerry Chant will provide um, further information um, in relation to that. But I think it's incredibly important uh, that we realise that simply because you may get a notification through your Service New South Wales app that you might have been at the grocery store or you might have been at a restaurant, uh, that does not constitute a close contact. A close contact legally uh, is someone who is a household contact of someone who is positive with COVID-19. Uh, finally, uh, today as well, we will be uh, releasing um, modeling. We released modeling last week in relation to um, the health system here in New South Wales in respect of hospitalizations and ICU presentations. Uh, and uh, on a worst case scenario last week, as we set out, uh, we have the capacity within our health system. And as we said, uh, both Susan uh, and myself last uh, Friday, early signs that that was very encouraging given what we were facing into. Uh, today we are releasing uh, where we are tracking against that modelling and whilst the health system is under pressure uh, and our health teams are doing an amazing job, uh, we are currently tracking at both an ICU and hospitalisation rate here in New South Wales better 
uh, than the best case scenario we released last week. Uh, so that is encouraging, uh, reassuring and pleasing. Uh, the health system is under pressure in this state, just like right around the country and right around the world as we move through this pandemic. It is going to be a difficult few weeks ahead, uh, but uh, the tracking that we are releasing today uh, is very reassuring um, and encouraging given where we sit today in the pandemic. Can I finish um, on some good news as well today? Um, and that is on our booster program, which uh, Susan Pierce will um, provide further information. Uh, today, uh, we can announce that over 40% of eligible people have received their booster shot. And so can I thank everybody across the state for that effort? Uh, it's the efforts and sacrifices that people have made right across New South Wales that has got us through uh, the, the pandemic over the last two years. Um, and it's incredibly pleasing, incredibly pleasing to see that effort has continued, particularly over the summer break, when many people have been on holidays, to be in a position today where over 40% of people have received uh, their booster shot uh, is incredibly encouraging. So can I thank everybody for the efforts that they are making. Once again, if you haven't received that booster shot uh, and it's been four months uh, since your second dose of vaccination, um, then please make an appointment uh, either at one of our 40 centres across the state or through your GP or your pharmacist. As I've said before, simply because you may have gone to your GP um, or through one of our centres last time, you can make that appointment at any one of those three areas, farm, at your pharmacist, your GP, um, or at any one of our centres right across the state. So I want to thank everybody for that effort. Vaccination is key. It has been, it has been the key to keeping people safe uh, during this difficult time. It is why here in New South Wales and right around the country, we have one of the lowest death rates, hospitalisation rates anywhere in the world. And that's because we have a vaccination rate of around 95%. And we can see in our hospitals today, in our ICUs, close to 50%, which has always been around that point, around 50% of people who are in ICU are unvaccinated. That is at a time when 95% of our population is vaccinated. So I often say the numbers don't lie, but the facts speak for themselves. Vaccination is key to keeping yourself, your friends and your family safe. So please continue uh, to make that effort. Uh, it has been the efforts that everybody has made across our state. I want to thank, those, thank people right across New South Wales for going out and taking that booster shot and getting vaccinated. Uh, that has been key. Uh, it is the efforts and sacrifices of, every, of everyone right across New South Wales uh, that has kept our state strong. And despite the challenges of the last two years, uh, despite the challenges that we are facing into today, uh, we will get through this together. And we'll get through this together, I know, uh, because those efforts that we've made are continuing right across our state. So thank you for all the efforts you're making. 40, that, that figure of 40% is incredibly pleasing. Uh, let's not rest on our laurels. If we continue to make that effort, we'll ensure we stay safe. We'll ensure we get through this pandemic together, just like we've done over the last two years. I'm now going to pass uh, to Dr Chant to give a public health update. Uh, and then Susan Pierce will speak to uh, both the booster program and also speak to how we're tracking um, in respect of the modelling for our hospital system here in New South Wales. So um, there are currently 2,525 COVID cases admitted to hospital, including 184 people in intensive care, 59 of whom require ventilation, and there were 63,018 positive tests notified to 8pm last night, including 37,938 positive rapid antigen tests and 25,080 positive PCR tests. Of the 37,938 positive rat tests, 24,329 of these positive tests were from the previous seven days. Um, obviously, we are working through pr um, processes to improve the data quality around the rat tests and deduplicate where we can, because some people may have had multiple rat tests or also gone on to have PCR tests. The 25,080 positive PCR test results were returned from 109,057 PCR tests. So again, thank you very much for the labs. 
laboratories and the swab collectors for their important work. Sadly, we are announcing the death of 29 people with COVID. The deaths of 15 men and 14 women. And can I also echo the Premier's condolences for those who have lost their loved ones. Three are in their 40s, five in their 60s, five are in their 70s, 11 are in their 80s and five are in their 90s. In terms of the um, people in their 40s, two were vaccinated with two doses of vaccine. Um, one had no record of vaccination and we know that that strain was Delta. Um, and in one of the cases, they had significant underlying health conditions and in relation to um, an immunosuppressive um, disease. In terms of the five in their 60s, four out of the five were not vaccinated. And the one vaccinated individual had had three doses, but again, had very significant underlying health issues. So can I echo the Premier's um, comments? It is important that everyone affords their opportunities to come forward for vaccination. It is a key. It, the vaccines work. We need to get that third dose to increase your protection against the Omicron variant. But it's also pleasing to see the numbers of 12 to 15 year olds have started to edge upwards and also the massive um, uptake for the five to 11 year olds. But it is not too late for anyone to come forward. Um, so please, if you haven't had your first dose, come forward now. Please get your booster, particularly if you're in those risk groups. Um, and we know GPs are prioritising access for some of those individuals in their practice. So again, if you're trying to book in, please be understanding. The general practice is juggling their capacity and trying to prioritise their vaccines for the group that will most benefit. I just wanted to cover off a couple of other issues. The, the Premier just wanted me to cover off the issue of close contacts. Under the requirements, close contacts, we're moving away from the term sort of close contacts. So we, we're focusing our efforts on those that are most at risk. So everyone probably can understand that household contacts are the group that's most at risk if you've got an infectious case in, in, in that um, setting. Um, we know the close proximity in households. We know that Omicron and other variants have spread very rapidly in households. So we're asking, there is a requirement that when you're notified as a case, um, you let your household know and your household is under an obligation to stay at home for those seven days, to do a rat test immediately and to do one at day six. We're, noted, um, we're letting people know that whilst you're most likely to acquire your infection in the first seven days after you're exposed to a case, we need people to be aware that the risk really extends for the full 14 days. So whilst 75% of cases will arise in that first seven days after you've been exposed, there will be a smaller number that can arise in that second seven days. So just be aware of that and, and take some precautions in terms of avoiding vulnerable settings where you can. Just be aware of that additional risk. Another key um, point and a, a sort of a way forward is for people to understand their personal circumstances. And I think um, we're moving away from the terminology close contacts or casual contacts because they meant certain things at certain times. What we're trying to do is inform the community about their level of risk following an exposure to COVID. And there's a guidance document which says, what do I do if I'm exposed to COVID on our website? And what it does is take you, takes you through what are your considerations? So if you spent a long time indoors with a person, I mean, close proximity without masks, that increases your risk. If it was a fleeting outdoor exposure, it's a low risk. Or if you've got a, a Service New South Wales ping that says you've been in the presence, you've pro probably been in an indoor environment where both of you have been masked, you've been socially distanced, low risk. You don't need to do anything, it's monitor for symptoms. So we are trying to um, provide the community with an understanding of their risk and asking them to calibrate their response depending on that level of risk and making those informed decisions. It's also important that this hasn't been probably very clear and I apologise with everything moving very um, rapidly. 
But given we've got so many people exposed to um, COVID, we've had many people with COVID. So if you've been diagnosed with COVID, so people with recent COVID who have had a high risk exposure, like a household contacts, um, they are not, and it's within 28 days, within four weeks of when they've been released from isolation, they are not considered at risk of reinfection and therefore don't have to isolate. So that may not have been clear. So for instance, if you've had COVID, you've gone in and done your seven days isolation, for the next four weeks, um, even if you get exposed to COVID or someone else in your household gets COVID that hadn't had it before, you do not need to isolate. You're considered um, pragmatically at uh, not to be considered at risk of reinfection for that, um, for that period. So I might um, pause there, but can I thank the community um, for all the efforts you're taking to slow the spread of COVID. It is important that we work to sort of flatten that curve and it's pleasing. Um, my colleague will present the data on how we're tracking against the projections. But everyone can play a role by, by wearing face masks in indoor settings, um, reducing your interaction across different social networks, using rat tests if you've got access for when, before you're entering some vulnerable settings, or special events where you might have lots of different generational mixing or mixing across social networks where there might be vulnerable people. So thank you to the community for just taking those small steps to keep yourself, your family and the community safe. Uh, thank you. Uh, look, it's obviously very pleasing for us to see the actuals uh, on that modelling graph track below the most optimistic pre uh, prediction that we presented to you last week. I want to be clear though about that. Uh, please don't read that as meaning that our health system is not under pressure. And modelling ultimately is modelling. Uh, behind every line and every dot on that page are people. And whether it's COVID uh, patients in our hospitals, people caring for themselves with COVID in the community, and of course our staff who are managing this day in, day out, at all fronts of the health system. Uh, we expect that pressure on our hospitals to continue for at, le at least the next few weeks, although what we are starting to become increasingly confident of is that we will see a plateauing next week. Uh, and that is pleasing, uh, but that plateauing is obviously still at a relatively high level of COVID patients in our hospitals and in our ICUs. The relationship between the hospitalisations, the cases, uh, and what we're projecting in terms of those recent cases is holding up quite well uh, and does give us a degree of confidence uh, about where we're headed, as I said, into the next couple of weeks. Some of the other things that were influencing those models when we presented them to you last week was that there was still a lot of uncertainty uh, in the data and that's why we produced three different lines. So as I said, very happy to see the actuals below the best prediction, uh, the most optimistic prediction. But the mix of Omicron and Delta was a, you know, a little less certain. The age distribution of who was getting COVID uh, how Omicron will translate into hospitalisation and of course the length of stay uh, for patients in our hospitals. In terms of that translation into hospitalisation, we can see very clearly that it is substantially lower when associated with Omicron. Uh, the hospitalisations speak for themselves in that regard. Uh, and also the length of stay is lower. But the consequence of that for our health system is that every day I'm seeing a lot of movement in and a lot of movement out of hospitals and that in and of itself generates a significant amount of work for our staff. And of course the impacts on the patients who are on the receiving end of that. Uh, pleasingly we have seen a reduction in emergency department attendances over the last week or so. Uh, that is very good uh, news and we thank the community as well for people who need to come to the emergency department, please keep coming. Uh, for those of you who have more minor illnesses, please consider what other uh, health care you could access, including Health Direct and of course your doctor or your pharmacy. 
With respect to vaccinations, uh, as uh, Kerry's mentioned, uh, whilst we are continuing uh, to see our community uh, adhere to social distancing and mask wearing uh, that is assisting us in this, uh, all the while we are getting those boosters into the arms of our community. We still have capacity in our clinics. Uh, for next week, uh, the week beginning the 17th, we'd expanded capacity in the New South Wales Health Clinics to be able to vaccinate more people. Uh, please do come forward. Uh, and certainly it's very pleasing to see, even today, uh, on top of the children uh, that we vaccinated yesterday, and we've done 12,000 uh, five to 11 year olds in the first four days of this week, which is excellent. Uh, we are still seeing every day more people coming forward for that first dose. And clearly that includes some children in the 12 to 15 year old age group. We've finally seen a bump in that number. Uh, of course, we would like to see that go higher. Uh, we aimed for 95% of our adult population here in New South Wales. Uh, we're above that for first doses. We continue to see the second doses increase. Uh, I think we can go even higher. And as we mentioned the other day, on a whole of population basis, we have a very strong vaccination rate in New South Wales. Uh, I mentioned that it was 78 or 79 per cent, it was actually 79.6. Uh, when you compare that to uh, other states in Australia, but also the rest of the world, uh, we have a very strong vaccination rate, which will only continue to grow. Okay. We have got those details for some of them, but at the moment um, our focus is understanding um, admissions to ICU and we've got a system where we are testing everyone in ICU. Uh, sometimes we won't be able to, in some of the circumstances, get sufficient sample from the cases to sequence. But we will work on improving, you know, getting as much data as we can so to inform the community. Just like to highlight the challenges of um, Whilst we are clearly excluding, um, people are probably aware that we've talked about this before, that when you um, test someone, particularly the PCR testing, it's very, very sensitive. And so you may well have cleared um, COVID and got over COVID for, uh, for a period of time and recovered. And then, then if you subsequently die, it still may be found in your nose and throat. Um, so we are working with the coroner and that's why if there's any deaths associated with um, deaths subsequently because they're screening admissions into the coronial system, we will report them in, in due course. But it does mean that we're reporting cases and we're not trying to say that they were directly caused by um, COVID um, and we're doing some further work to look at the underlying reasons and give the community more information about that. Um, but it is an important question for us to understand the Delta versus Omicron um, deaths, so we will follow that up with the team. So um, vaccinated, vaccinations work really well, but they're not, um, they can't protect everyone. And that's why you need a multiple, multiple layers of protection. And that's why we advise people to take care around vulnerable people. Um, we ask people to take those additional precautions. So we will tragically still see deaths in, in individuals that are vaccinated. But that doesn't mean the vaccines are so good at protection, particularly the third dose. We know that that third dose of vaccination is, is critical for Omicron in increasing the level of protection. But the vaccines we have available are, are safe and effective. And the fundamentally best thing you can do is get vaccinated and get your booster as quickly as possible. But we will see deaths in people that are fully vaccinated. Do you know what the proportion of people in ICU at the moment and also of those who are dying have We um, do have that data. I haven't got that to hand. But can I just say, when I was looking through the admissions last night to ICU, particularly the younger admissions, it was very stark that the vast majority of them were unvaccinated. So I do, I mean, I, I think that admissions to ICU with, um, is a rarer event, but it is very stark that um, the predominance of people in ICU is still 
for the unvaccinated. So the key message is I'm not going to stand here and say the vaccines will... The vaccines are very safe, effective, um, but there will be certain um, groups with very significant underlying health conditions that will need um, to take some additional protections. And I think we've talked about how we need to protect the vulnerable in our communities. Um, so the issues around um, where we've set the guidance, we really encourage everyone in the community to think about the risks that, that are posed. I think we've been very clear about singing and dancing. Part of the issues around music festivals or events in pubs and clubs or other settings, it brings together um, different groups or contacts with different um, people in different social networks. And so there's a lot of mingling. Some of those issues don't occur when people are in um, fixed locations or with fixed social networks. But clearly we would also encourage everyone to be thoughtful and I would be urging everyone to think about minimising singing in indoor environments. Um, that would be in both households when you're having a party and in um, other settings and to take those precautions. Move things outdoors if you can. So in terms of the general public health advice, it's very clear. We know those behaviours add to risk. Um, move things outdoors wherever you can. Ensure ventilation and that wearing masks provide some protection but not comprehensive protection. And we would urge everyone to consider the nature of activities they engage in. Uh, no, we're not. And as you can see, um, in relation to the tracking that we provided today. Uh, we put that modelling out uh, last week and I think the tracking today is very reassuring. Uh, please don't take that, um, that tracking to suggest that the system is not under pressure. We're in a pandemic. Uh, all hospital systems uh, are under pressure right around the world. Uh, New South Wales is no different. Uh, what we are very blessed by here in our state is having great frontline workers who are working tirelessly each and every day. Uh, but I think from what you can see today um, that uh, we should have confidence um, that we have the capacity within our system. Um, those models are there, the tracking is there. We'll release that um, every week. It'll be provided um, on the health website. Um, but uh, as we know, we've invested significantly, significantly uh, over many, many years in our public health system here in New South Wales. At the start of the pandemic, we invested around $4 billion more uh, in health to keep people safe. Um, and I think we can be reassured today um, that as we move through this period, which will be very difficult, um, that the tracking today shows that it's very pleasing the position that New South Wales is in. Sorry, say that again. Well, what we're working on right now is our return to school plan. We've been working on that uh, over the last couple of weeks but with New South Wales Health and the Department of Education. Uh, we had some very constructive discussions yesterday at National Cabinet. Uh, every state and territory agreed uh, to those principles. We're working very closely with the Victorian Government to provide, uh, I guess, a similar framework and approach from an operational perspective as we move through that. And we will present um, those plans to National Cabinet. I don't want to give a running commentary on what may or may not be in those plans. Uh, what I will say is we will have kids back in school on day one, term one, in an environment that is safe for teachers and for students. That is our number one focus. As we saw yesterday uh, through the National Cabinet, uh, the importance of having kids in the classroom, not just for their own um, learning and educational outcomes and opportunities in life, uh, it is crucial, it is an essential service that ki and it's essential for students to be in the classroom but also for parents so as we move through this year uh, parents can be back in the workforce. Um, the modelling yesterday from the Commonwealth Treasury indicated that we would have, if we did not open schools, 
we'd have another 5% of the workforce who would not be able to go to work uh, because kids were not at school. Now, as I've said, there will be challenges as we move through this. Through, through this. Uh, there will be bumps along the way, uh, but we will get through it. We are working right across the board day and night with every team across government to ensure that we safely get kids back in the classroom. There are different aspects and states might take different approaches. I believe from a New South Wales perspective, we work closely in alignment with Victoria, two states that are in a very similar situation in respect of this uh, latest COVID outbreak um, that will be in a strong position to achieve kids in the classroom day one in a very safe way. Well, we've obviously, the, the areas and the exemptions that we provided uh, as agreed through National Cabinet yesterday are crucial uh, for distribution and for emergency services uh, and for areas uh, which are under pressure and we need staff to attend. So we've asked employers to work very closely with the employees and they have been doing that. The changes that we made just last week in relation to distribution networks, the consultation and work that we've undertaken um, with the supermarket chains and the like, they are working very closely with their employees to ensure only those workers who need to be back in those circumstances come back. But as we're seeing, not just in New South Wales, but around the country, there are certain areas which are essential for the functioning of society that need to be brought back as quickly as possible. But importantly, there are substantial precautions in place as well, like fa face mask wearing in, in those environments. Um, and, um, and in many cases, um, rapid antigen tests are also provided to provide that surety that we ensure that those workers who are deemed to be, who are, who are classified close contacts, who, who are in those areas, are doing so in a safe way. Yeah. Um, how confident are you that you'll have adequate supply ahead of that to be able to service your back to school plan? And is supply of rapid antigen tests informing how you use them in terms of the test that they have for the surveillance? What was the last part, Tom? Is the supply of rats informing yeah. how you actually use them with back to school plan in terms of right. you're going to be able to be tested today or if you will yet have enough? Right, so no, what, I mean, we haven't made any decisions yet in relation to tests to stay or surveillance. Uh, we have not made those decisions yet. Clearly they are part of our considerations and uh, we are having discussions with New South Wales Health, the Department of Education and also the Victorian Government and the Commonwealth Government um, in relation to if we were to have the use of rapid antigen tests in the classroom, we think that that's a strong possibility, um, how they will be used and what's the best way of using them. Now. Uh, the agreement that we have with the federal government in relation to the cost sharing arrangements with respect of rapid antigen tests, if they are used for a public health purpose, that um, there will be a 50-50 funding arrangement. That has been confirmed by um, the Prime Minister. We'll work through those plans and finalise them, present them to National Cabinet next week. My expectation is that you will see rapid antigen tests as a key part of it. In terms of supply, you know, we. I think our state has certainly led the way when it comes to supply of rapid antigen tests. We've procured um, already 50 million. We are procuring a, an additional 50 million. They will be used uh, by the New South Wales government in a range of settings across the board to instill confidence as we move through this um, next phase. A number of those tests have already arrived and we have complete confidence we will have enough supply to provide for the plan uh, once it's finalised next week. Where will they arrive though, if it still goes back next yep. week? Will they arrive on time? Yeah, so we've already seen a number that have already arrived and and, our, and there's a number of um, rapid antigen tests that will arrive in New South Wales um, over the four day, over four days over the course of next week. Four regional, regional. So Chris and now. Four regional, there's yep. the instance where some Sydney schools are coming out of batch cars, if you like, the kids vaccination. Will that be available to regional schools as well? I might, I might leave Susan to answer that. Uh, at present, uh, we are not intending a, a school-based program for the vaccinations. What we did last time with the 12 to 15 year olds was encourage those kids to come along to our hubs, to the GPs, to the pharmacies. Uh, we can see already for the 5 to 11 year olds a strong uptake that's occurred this week. Uh, what we did last time was then 
toward the end of that, uh, we certainly assisted in uh, schools uh, with children with special needs and went out to assist them and then to try to assist where perhaps the rates were a little lower on a local level. Uh, our pharmacies and our districts did go out and assist in some of the schools. With respect to regional New South Wales, uh, we will continue, as we did last time, to run mobile clinics uh, and to work hard to make sure that we uh, get to everybody who needs to have a vaccine. Uh, but I do note we are in a very different position now to the position we were in last year with supply issues. Uh, and whilst there have been some early uh, supply concerns from our GP and pharmacy colleagues, as I said the other day, we expect that to continue to improve significantly. There are many distribution points right throughout the state uh, and it's really important that uh, kids uh, obviously are given the opportunity to have that vaccine as soon as possible. Sorry, what was the question? Yeah. Well, we dealt with that challenge last year, and what was most important to us was to get schools back as quickly as possible, and we did that. And the overwhelming number of schools, they all remained open. Now, there were some when there were outbreaks from time to time where there were school closures but that was the exception to the rule. Now, we're also in a very different environment um, going into 2022 school term. We have a highly vaccinated population. Uh, at high schools, we see um, very high rates of vaccination for secondary school students. Uh, as part of the plans, um, we, will, we are working through how, how those issues are managed. And I'm very confident from what I'm seeing um, that school disruption in terms of actual school closures will be your last resort. Um, so I'm very confident with where we're heading. As I said, I don't believe that it will not be without its difficulties and challenges. We are in a pandemic. Um, there will be, we have a, we, have a, um, we have a highly vaccinated population. That should give confidence. But we're seeing around the world, we're seeing around the world, there are challenges with schools. That's not gonna be any different here. But the work is going on day and night, and I believe the plans that will present uh, to National Cabinet next week will give confidence and certainty to teachers and to parents that schools will be opening safely day one, term one. So they will, yeah, they will, they will form part. They're not on that list at the moment. They will form part of our return to school plans next and week. When will that be finalised? So our intention is to present to National Cabinet. Um, the New South Wales government's return to school plan on Thursday. My expectation based on yesterday's discussion is that all premiers uh, and chief ministers will present those plans, the operational plans uh, to the national cabinet and following that we will release them. When can the Sydney Cider uh, turn up to a chemist and be able to just buy a rapid free easily? Uh, buy a rapid? Buy a rapid chemist. Yeah, well we would expect a private supply chain just like the arrival of the rapid antigen tests here for the New South Wales government and the Commonwealth government and states around the country uh, to be increasing uh, over the coming weeks. Uh, we're certainly seeing in terms of our procurement uh, of our 50 million tests, a significant arrival over the course of the next week. We've already had some arrive. So my expectation would be um, in the coming weeks, uh, we would see a number of those rapid antigen tests arrive. I'd also make this point just to confirm to the Service New South Wales app, which many people have been recording their positive tests. But if you have done a PCR test, uh, as it sets out on the app, you do not need to register your positive rapid antigen test. If you have a PCR test that is positive, uh, and that has been recorded by New South Wales Health, and you are in isolation, or it's been, it's been in the past, uh, there is no need, in fact, there is no requirement uh, to be um, recording that positive rapid antigen test. No, I, I think, I, I mean, I was completely shocked last night uh, to see that footage. Um, and New South Wales Health was dealing with that last night. And I think I echo the frustration and anger that people right across the state felt. What has got us through the last two years has been the efforts and sacrifices that many have made to keep people safe. That means that many businesses 
have had to tailor the way they operate. Many people have had to change their behaviour to keep people safe. Now, we made those rules, um, and even if technically it was, uh, it was within the rules, uh, it certainly wasn't in the spirit of the rules. Um, now, I understand uh, that Hillsong are ensuring that that doesn't occur again, but I was incredibly disappointed. People, the, the, these rules aren't there for the sake of it. These rules are in place to keep people safe. Um, and for the 99.95% of people who are doing the right thing, I think everyone uh, would feel completely frustrated and shocked by what they saw last night. Um, and you know, we don't want to see that happen again. We've made it very clear, as Dr. Chant has just pointed out, uh, in those settings, there is to be no singing and dancing. And there are many hospitality venues that have had to curb their operations in order to keep people safe as we move through um, this next period of time. So to see that last night, I was incredibly disappointed. Premier, why would the police rule out a fine for a benefit seen by the health minister as a recreational facility and a breach of the public? Well, the authorities will work through that. And my view is if, if, the, if um, the legal teams believe that it was in breach of the public health order, um, then my expectation would be that a fine would be in place by the, uh, by the police force. But even if it is through a loophole, I mean, if we have to tighten loopholes, we will. But I don't want to do that because that means it will capture you know, a whole lot of other organisations that are doing the right thing. So the vast majority of people across our state are doing the right thing. They're following the rules to keep people safe. Um, and this was an, this was an exception uh, to what everybody else right across the state, the efforts, the sacrifices that people are making. Um, and I'll take the advice in relation to uh, the, the legal teams at New South Wales Health. And if they are in breach, which, which is what the information I've received from the health minister uh, is, then a fine should be issued. Now, the Premier and Prime Minister COVID parties, well, they should not be doing that, and we have made it very clear here in our state to minimise um, large household gatherings. In addition to that, as the Prime Minister uh, clearly pointed out yesterday, there can be rates of reinfection. So, uh, there, anyone thinking uh, that is a good idea is completely wrong. Um, and once again, though, the, these are the exceptions. And what I'm very pleased about as Premier of our state is that 99% of people right across New South Wales are doing the right thing. It's those efforts, it's following the rules that are in place that have kept people safe during this entire pandemic. Now, from time to time, people do the wrong thing. But I say, if you're thinking about having one of those parties, don't have one follow the guidance that we have provided. And even outside of those parties, we've asked people to minimise household visitations, to minimise large household gatherings. Uh, and th that's clearly the position we've taken. And in the main, I want to thank everybody for making the effort. And particularly at a time when it's summer, it's m many people are on holidays right across the state uh, at, a, at a difficult time. And many people, almost everyone, is adhering to those rules. So was that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're doing the right thing. Oh, the festivals, yes. festival organisers. Well, we. I mean, I very much appreciate the sacrifices those festival organisers have made. Now, we, when we made those changes last week, the majority of events. Uh, will ha have, have continued over this period of time. A, a number have had to be postponed. Um, over, the last, over the last 12 months, where there's been a substantial impact on festivals, we've provided that financial support to help get them through, and we will do the same again. Um, and I know the Treasurer and the teams are working very closely on it, but I can completely understand how outraged they would be in circumstances where they're doing the right thing and others are doing the wrong thing. But I'd also make the point, the majority of people across our state are doing an amazing job. 
We are in the strong position here in New South Wales because of those efforts and sacrifices that everyone has made. And that's why when we see footage of what we saw last night, it's incredibly frustrating and disappointing to everybody across New South Wales. Yeah. Here you go. He's got, go. Quick, quick, thing, no, no, go. Quick one on rapid tests, yeah. fake rapid antigen tests, getting into the market. How are they getting into the market? And are you monitoring that? I'll take that on notice. Okay. One, one second. Well, it's very important to me to have a very good relationship with all the leaders across the country. We're all going through this together. We're just going through it at different times. Um, Victoria and New South Wales are obviously on the front line, but it will not be too long before other states are in the same position that we're, here, that we're at in New South Wales and Victoria. When I was treasurer for five years, and particularly over the last two years, I had a very close relationship with the Victorian treasurer because our situations were very similar. I think collaboration and cooperation, I know there's, a mate, there's, there's always a focus on division, but behind the scenes, uh, we have learnt a lot from other states. We've learned a lot and provided information to help at various times. We've shared resources right across, right across the country. I, I don't think um, that uh, that collaboration and cooperation has got anywhere near the coverage that it deserves, because obviously division gets the headlines. Uh, but uh, from my experience as treasurer, we've had a very close relationship to the Board of Treasurers. When we were working on those packages and financial packages to help businesses stay open, to help people stay in work, we shared so much information and helped each other get through. Ultimately, we're Australians first and foremost, and by working together, we'll get better outcomes. So when it comes to, for example, um, the, re the return to school plan, it makes perfect sense for Victoria and New South Wales to share information, to work together. There might be things that we haven't thought of. There might be things that they haven't thought of. So I think by sharing those plans and working together, we'll, we'll get a better landing. And in circumstances where Victoria and New South Wales are in very similar circumstances and have the same philosophical approach to getting kids back in the classroom, I think it makes perfect sense. And I'll continue to do that as Premier because we're gonna have challenges over the next 12 months and beyond. And if we all continue to work together and share that information and, not, and, and have a cooperative federation and relationship, our people are gonna be better off for it. Premier, and then Chris, yeah. Exemptions for critical workers. Have yeah. you been given any indication as to when you expect us to market shelves more normal? Um, Well, the, the, the feedback is positive from, the, from uh, the supermarkets, that the changes that we've made are making a difference um, and uh, that already we're seeing a number of those distribution chains come back on or that were significantly impacted by the, close, the previous close contact provision. So my expectation is that that will return shortly. There will obviously be a lag, but obviously the changes as well to agriculture will help as well. So it's not just a simple fix for, for example, Woolworths and Coles, uh, and Audi, this, there, there's, there's a deeper impacts right across the supply and distribution chain. But my expectation would be, based on the changes that we've made, that we'll see that those shortages return very quickly. Just the uh, by-election delays, Remy, which I imagine you see as being probably appropriate given the circumstances. But also, I just want to ask you, when, when you saw the number of deaths this morning, and given the awful week that we've had, has it at any point shaken your resolve about whether or not we're on the right path in terms of our attention? I believe we're completely on the right path. The only way out of this is to push through. And that's exactly what our people are doing. Uh, we, when we've talked about over the last two years, learning to live alongside the virus, there's always going to be challenges uh, through this transition. We, we have to live in the world as it is not as we want it to be. Uh, COVID is not something that is unique to New South Wales. It is happening all around the world. And what has been key in our state has been that vaccination rate. That booster rate today for eligible people above 40% is incredibly pleasing. And that means that as we move through, 
will continue to have one of the lowest death rates anywhere in the world. But the reality is in a pandemic, there are going to be hospitalizations and ICUs. Uh, you know, these, th these, are, these are always confronting and difficult things, not just for leaders to face, but for all people right across New South Wales and right across the world to face into. But the best thing that we can do is get vaccinated and then learning to live alongside the virus as we move through, there's, there's an adjustment. We've, we've already seen over the last, well, generally over the, over the summer period, as we've had an increase in cases, the challenges that that's brought, the cues that people have had to endure um, lining up for PCRs, the transition into rapid antigen tests, the furloughed workforces. Uh, these are difficulties that we're facing in New South Wales and right around the country, but we're gonna get through. And I think sometimes we can sit there and to your question, Chris, like, you know, it, it is confronting. It is always confronting to see um, those figures of people who have died. Behind every, behind every one of those numbers is a person, is a family that's lost a loved one. And we've gone through this over the last, we've gone through this over the last two years where people have not been able to say goodbye to their loved ones because of restrictions we've had in place on funerals. People have had restricted weddings and haven't, and haven't been able to celebrate such a momentous day in the way that they would have liked. And we've done everything we can to try and have society operating and open as much as possible to return as much of society to normal. And we will do that. And that is exactly what's gonna happen. We are gonna get through this. We are gonna get through this and come out as a people stronger. And our people have made those sacrifices. They have stood tall. They have stood strong in the face of incredible, incredible adversity. And we've got through it and we will get through this. And unfortunately, there'll be difficulties and challenges in whatever we do along the way. But we're not an island here in New South Wales. We are not, uh, we are not unique to the rest of the world. The only, well, what is unique about our people is that they are incredibly strong. They're incredibly resilient. We will push through this. We will get back to normal and there'll be other difficulties and potentially other waves that come our way. Who knows, who knows uh, what, what, where the next curveball for COVID in 2022 will come from. But we need to accept that this is the world that we live in um, and, we will and we will ensure that we adjust. Our number one focus is to keep people safe. But I have complete confidence that the strength of the people of New South Wales will shine through this outbreak as it has for the last two years and we will come out stronger. We will keep our people safe. We will keep our businesses open and we'll keep people in work. That has been our success over the last two years and will be our success as we move through the next 12 months. I'll take, I'll take some advice on that and I'll come back to you. Premier, it's disappointing a female candidate wasn't pre-selected for the seat of Willoughby. Well, we had three exceptional candidates. Three exceptional candidates um, in the pre-selection uh, last night. I, I would love to have pre-selected uh, all three of them. Um, and we have competitive processes and I congratulate Tim James. I've, I've known Tim for many years. Uh, he's an outstanding man, a, a young family man who uh, will, I believe, make an uh, extraordinary contribution. Uh, not just to Willoughby, uh, but to the New South Wales uh, Parliament and, um, and beyond. And uh, I have complete faith uh, that he will uh, continue the great legacy of Gladys Berry Jicklean in representing uh, the great people of the state of Willoughby. And to the other candidates in, in Gail and Kelly, um, you know, they are also outstanding individuals and I'll be contacting them later today uh, because I think that they have a great contribution to make uh, to the people of New South Wales. Uh, but uh, if we look at, if I look across the board in terms of the, the by-elections that are coming up from the Liberals and Nationals, uh, we have some exceptional candidates and that's incredibly pleasing. If we have on both sides of politics, good people putting their hands up to run for public life, our state uh, is richer for it. And to have Tim uh, you know, uh, being nominated for the seat of Willoughby and Bridget Saker for the seat of um, for the seat of Strathfield and Fiona Cotvoy in the seat of Bega and Nicole Overall uh, in the seat of Monero. Three strong women and, 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 and a great man in Tim putting their hands up 
for public office and I think that's a great thing and I also think it's a great thing for our party to have such high calibre and talented people put their hand up to run for the seat of Willoughby and to have a strong contest can only be a good thing uh, for the party and for the people of our state. Uh, look, uh, to some extent, this, this is a very challenging modelling question, but um, speaking to some of the modellers, which I respect, um, we may see around 50% of the population um, impacted in this first wave of Omicron. Um, so some, not everyone will get COVID in the first, in the first wave. Um, and I think we're all interested to see what the future um, comes from. We will see the numbers go down. Um, it's Um, we could see 50% of people in the first wave um, get Omicron. Now, not all of those will have symptomatic infection or even know that they've been infected. Um, so there still will be people that have not experienced or been exposed to Omicron. The key for us is getting as many vaccines into individuals because um, we want people to be fully vaccinated with a three dose, including the booster, before they have the opportunity to be exposed if they do get exposed to Omicron. So that's the rationale for why we want to slow the spread to get those boosters in and get as many people with optimally protected. Look, I think that this is still understanding long COVID's going to be researched intensively. When I last engaged with some experts on this, they indicated that there did seem to be a correlation where you're less likely to get long COVID if you had a milder disease. We know that people that are vaccinated will have generally a less torrid course than people that are not vaccinated. Can I just, um, the question about the COVID party was just, um, I was just, really horrified um, to, around COVID party. It is not, you know, although we talk about Omicron being a milder disease, it can still cause serious consequences. So please, I would hate to be have a situation where people were knowingly um, exposing themselves to, to any COVID virus. Please keep yourself safe and take those precautions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.